Well, welcome to the penultimate chapter in Acts, where Paul ships to Rome, and he enters a storm. I like this cartoon by Gary Brookings and Susie McNeely. Um, Paul does have a severe taskmaster at times. So let's read Acts 27, verses 1 to 12. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship from Edramitium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea, there we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea, along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing to Italy, and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days, and arrived in, with difficulty off Snidus, and as the wind did not allow us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salom. Salmone. Coasting along, it was uh, with difficulty we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was all, already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of cargo and ship, but of our lives. <laughs> but the centurion paid no attention to uh, the, or paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to Paul and what he had said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there, on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Well, Paul is finally on his way to Rome. It's about a 1,900-mile trip. First thing I want you to notice is the pronoun we. Luke is back with Paul, and this is written by Luke, and it's rich in detail, as Luke often does. I counted some 20 specific details uh, that shows his sense of history. One example of this is just naming the ship. It was from Adramitrium, which you can see is in the northern part up in the Adriatic. And they left the temple for Caesarea, down here to Caesarea. And uh, at least three times he gave witness in Caesarea to Festus, Felix, and King Agrippa. And now the ship was headed towards Rome. Notice, too, that Adramitrium is near the Dardanelles, and Troas is right here. Troas is the place from which Paul went over to Philippi, crossing the sea into Macedonia. Julius is from the Augustan court, which is a specific, I'm sorry, cohort, uh, which is a specific cohort named after the August Caesar, or Caesar Augustus. There are ten cohorts in a legion, so that's about 500 soldiers. And Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, is with them. Uh, we, we saw him back in Acts 19 when Paul preached against the silversmith in Ephesus and Gaius and Aristarchus were dragged off the stage with Paul. We also saw him in Acts 20 along with several others that uh, left Ephesus to meet Paul and Troas on the way to Macedonia. And then in about 61 AD from a prison in Rome, he's going to write the letter to Philemon and it says in verse 23 to 24, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, the writer of the Acts, and my fellow workers. And then we'll see him once more in uh, 62 AD when Paul's imprisoned in Rome. In Colossians, it says in 4, uh, 410, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, 
the cousin of Barnabas. Now we'll say a little bit more about him in a few minutes. At Sidon, uh, Julius the Centurion treated Paul kindly, and he allowed Paul to uh, visit with friends in the city. That's about a day's travel from Caesarea and about 80 miles. And they sailed then under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against them. And, of course, winds in a sailing boat can make all the difference. It's about 400 miles to Myra. And they're going to pass uh, Cilicia. Remember, Saul is from Cilicia. And they pass Pamphylia. And they go to Lycia, which is this area, and to Myra. And I thought it was particularly beautiful. If you notice in Myra, they have these uh, homes or businesses built into the mountain all the way up to the top. It's just a beautiful place. And here's Sidon, a major seaport that they've uh, left. Now, the centurion found a new ship there, and it was going their way. So from there, uh, they were headed towards Snidus. Uh, the ship was out of Alexandria, which you know is in Egypt. It's about 180 miles, and they had unfavorable winds. Now, Paul has crossed the Adriatic from Troas to Macedonia, but that's a shorter trip, much shorter trip. You've got to wonder whether he's experiencing seasick and some of the others on board are, and we'll find later that it's pretty cramped on board. Now, there's no record of Paul having been here before, but notice that Ephesus is not too far to the north, and he's been there and lived there for a couple of years. Now, this harbor's unusual in that actually has two harbors. The western harbor is for the military and the eastern is commercial. And you can leave out of here and head north to the Aegean, northwest to Greece, and west to Rome because it's the uh, southern tip of what's present-day Turkey. It also was then famous at that time for Aphrodite of Sinitus, which was made in the fourth century, sculpted then. Uh, that's also the god Venus. Now they sailed on to Crete, and they passed the Cape Salome, which is the northeasternmost tip of Crete, and with difficulty they came to Fair Havens. Uh, this is near Lhasa, and Lhasa is, it looks close there, but it's about two miles away from Fair Havens. And uh, it's a harbor that basically faces east, as you can see down in this area. So when the weather starts turning wintry and bad, the winds will come out of the east or the northeast, the nor'easter. And Luke notes that the uh, fast is over. He's talking about the Day of Atonement. So this puts it around October. And in verse 10, Paul says, Sirs, I perceive the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo in the ship, but also of our lives. And the centurion ignored Paul and favored the counsel of the pilot and the owner of the ship. So you have to wonder, is this prophecy or opinion? Well, I think the centurion thought it was opinion. It turns out to be prophecy. So they decide to head for Phoenix, which is further down. You can see it here in pink. Uh, it's only um, about a four-hour trip, something like that, in calm waters. And it has a dual harbor. You see, if the winds are coming from the northeast, they can slip around here and be protected. And if the winds are coming from the other direction, they slip over to this harbor and are protected. Problem is that there are really no major cities around, and they might have to live on their own stores. But uh, there are 276 people on board, as we'll find out, and there's a high demand for food. So let's move on to the next section, 13 to 20. It says, now when the south winds blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. They're headed to Phoenix. But soon a tempestuous wind called a northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat, and after hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that all would run aground in the citrus, they lowered the gear 
and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo, and on the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither the sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all our hope of being saved was at last abandoned. What? Well, when you have a south wind coming up, it's coming off this desert area, and this gulf here is the citrus, and the south winds blowing in this direction are favorable, and they can tack in this and head towards Rome, and this is a dry wind. But when the winds come in a different direction from the northeast, it pushes them out to sea, and they want to avoid this gulf here because, one, it's uncharted, and it's thought to have had shallow areas, and if they get blown ashore, there's really no water. It's desert there. It's very unfavorable for these people. So they want to push out to sea, and they pass to the lee of Cauda, this island. They had tried to go to the Phoenix Harbor, but couldn't make it, and were headed in this direction. Now, in those days, they often had a lifeboat, which they uh, let trail behind the main vessel because it took up deck space and there really wasn't a lot of room for people but now they had to take it in to secure it so it didn't get broken or, or washed away and it's a small vessel with 276 on board it's very crowded on deck and likely it looked more like this <clears throat> they would be concerned that the cargo might shift and the, if the cargo shifts, it could uh, unbalance the boat and take on more water. Any waves could splash water in, and that would sink the boat lower in the water and then favor more water coming on board. So they needed to get rid of weight, and uh, they tossed the cargo out. They lowered the sails and stored the gear, they called it. But Ultimately, they felt they had to get rid of that because the danger of the weight outweighed the advantage that they might have later. They also uh, roped the ship, in a sense. They would put longitudinal ropes from the bow to the stern to prevent stresses of sagging and moderate and heavy seas. And then they'd have two men stand at the front and then run a rope underneath the boat so it was lateral. And that would prevent the planks from splitting and the seams from opening as a result of the twisting and flexing of the hull. So these were desperate measures to avoid the dangers of citrus sands and to try to hold the ship together. So their three-hour trips to Phoenix is now a three-day trip to hell. All hope was abandoned. Now let's look at, uh, here they are, they're headed out to sea and they're in this horrendous storm. Let's read verses 21 to 37. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood among them and said, Men, you have listened to me and have not set sail for Crete, or you should have listened to me and set sail for Crete, and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For this very night stood before me an angel of the God of, to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all of those who sail with you. So take heart, for I have faith in God that he will be exactly as I have told you, as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected they were nearing land, so they took a sounding and found twenty fathoms. A little further they took a sounding again and found fifteen fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they lay down four anchors in the stern and prayed for the day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Saul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. 
As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food and taken nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. For not a hair on your head is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God, in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they were encouraged and ate some food themselves, and we were in all 276 persons in this ship. Well, it appears that Paul is saying, I told you so, but actually he's exerting his authority. He's reminding them that he did prophesy disaster, and disaster has happened. They're still alive, barely, but they've lost their cargo. They haven't eaten. They have no tackle. Uh, they really haven't drunk much, and the storm is 24 hours a day. They just can't get away from it. And then he tells them that an angel of God has spoken with them. Do not be afraid. <laughs> right. The angel uh, didn't talk about the storm. But the angel said that Paul would stand before Caesar. Now, this is what it's, I would call a second-order prophecy. It's not about the immediate concern of the storm. He said, God has granted you uh, all those who sail with you, meaning that they will go on to Italy with him. So take heart, men. And then he prophesies, we must run aground on some island. Well, they took soundings, the water got shallower, a fathom is about six feet, so it went from 120 feet to about 90 feet, and it's changing rapidly, so that's a reasonable concern. So they put out four sea anchors, and a sea anchor in many different shapes. It's just something that increased drag, so the ship won't turn broadside to the waves and be crushed by the waves on the broadside or being overwhelmed by them. It lowers the cross-section. Now, desperate men do desperate things, and the sailors tried to get away on the lifeboat that was on the deck. And Paul said, unless these men stay, you cannot be saved. So, the, remarkably, the soldiers cut the ropes away and let the boat go. Now, they've got no lifeboat. But it's reasonable. The soldiers are not sailors, and they don't want to be abandoned. You know, think about the reverse. If this, they were in a battle, and the soldiers are trying to escape, leaving the seamen to do the fighting... The seamen would feel resentful at the least. Uh, so they did not want to be abandoned. The soldiers didn't. Well, the next morning, Paul urges them to eat and says, Not a heron is to perish from your head of any of you. Well, we all like to cling to hope. And right now, Paul's the only one offering hope. Paul is not a sailor. He's not a centurion. He's not a soldier. He's a landlubber with no authority. But people are believing in him. They're watching him walk the walk. And then Paul led them in a form of communion, a calm in the face of danger. And they were encouraged. And there were 276 on board. That's crowded. It's hard to imagine that they would all be saved. Well, in 38 to 44, it says, And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. And now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea. At the same time, they loosened the ropes that tied the rudders. They hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable and the stern was being torn apart by the surf. The, surf. the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should uh, swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or pieces of ship. And so it was that they were all brought safely to land. Well, they threw out the wheat, the last, really, of their food, and they sailed towards the beach, uh, where they thought they could take control and the water would be calmer, but they hit a reef. They were torn apart by the waves. It's natural that the soldiers would want to kill the prisoners, because it boils down to the prisoner's life or their life. Uh, if the prisoners escape, they would be killed. But the uh, 
centurion intervened and protected Paul and the prisoners. So you have to ask them, what is the story really about? Well, companionship, hardship, and refuge. I use the word companionship because not all of them were Christian. Maybe relationship is a better word. They were, when you're thrown together in dire circumstances, you do make strong relationship. And think about this, there are 276 on board. Three of them we know were Christians, Paul, uh, Aristarchus, and Luke. So at least 273 probably non-believers. And that's the way our boat in life is. We Christians are outnumbered. Uh, these companions came from different strata. You had commanders, like the captain of the vessel and the centurion. You had sailors and soldiers that, that do the commander's bidding. They protect and dominate, often selfish people. They want to protect themselves by abandoning the ship like the sailors or protect themselves by killing the prisoners. And then you got the fellow peons like us. And sometimes it overlaps. And then you've got in there in the mix and uh, Christ followers. So we're called to share experience, and in so doing, we can we share our emotions and our destinies. Our stories intersect, and people get to see us in a better way. They get to see how we weather the storm. Um, they know when they're in that bad storm that they may not get out alive, but they're right. You know, none of us is going to get out of this alive unless we're a Christian. And once we become a Christian, then our life is eternal. So the story here is about proclaiming the gospel, the good news. It's also about hardship. And that's an integral part of companionship or relationship. The winds turned sour, and the captain had them reinforce the boat, trim the sails, ditch the cargo, and they were battered for two weeks, day and night. Now, most of their companions gave up hope. But when we walk with our companions through the valley of the shadow of death, our companions will watch us closely for signs of weakness or lack of faith. And we must believe that God is our refuge. I've been reading a biography of Thomas Jackson. He uh, showed bravery in the Mexican-American War and as such was promoted to brevet major. Then at Harper's Ferry, he went out in reconnaissance and force for the Confederacy. Uh, he had been a teacher at Virginia Military Institute and was not really liked. He was mocked and teased by all the students and the faculty didn't really stop that. But at Harper's Ferry, where John Brown led the abolitionists and subsequently was hung, uh, he went against the Northern uh, Army and he defeated them. And as such, he was promoted uh, in the Battle of Manassas, he wound up having a center position. He was a colonel. And he picked an unusual but brilliant defensive position. And he rode in front of his uh, troops on his horse without flinching. He had his finger, his index finger, on his left hand, wounded from a bullet. He had bullet holes through his clothes, yet he never showed any sign of, sign of fear. At one point, he was sitting by a tree writing an order, and a cannonball blew up nearby, covered him with debris and dust, and he just nonchalantly wiped the dust off the paper on which he was writing and finished his report and went on. When he told the troops to counterattack, he told them to yell like the Furies. Well, the Furies are a mythical people that uh, were in the Iliad and the Odyssey that kind of lured people to bad places where the ships would be destroyed, a little like Paul. Well, they did yell. They didn't know what he meant, but they yelled, and that was called later the rebel yell. And also because of the way he stood his ground in Manassas and showed no fear, one general referred to him as standing there like a stone wall. Hence, Stonewall Jackson. And he was asked by a soldier, how is it that you can keep so cool and appear so utterly insensitive to danger in such a storm of shells and bullets as rained about you when your hand was hit? He responded, Captain, 
My religious beliefs teach me to feel safe in battle as in bed. God has fixed the time for my death. I do not concern myself about that, but to be always ready, no matter when it may overtake me. That's the way all men should live, and then we would all be equally brave. What set Stonewall Jackson apart is not only did he say that, he believed it. Well, it's a story about refuge, and uh, refuges can be necessary. William Hillary uh, noted that sailors were sometimes uh, shipwrecked in the Sea of Ireland, between Ireland and Great Britain, and uh, he wanted to develop a lifeboat service of trained crew to be available to rescue people. And he took part in one rescue and washed overboard and realized that the coast was too far to swim to, that is the coast of England or Ireland, and made it to the Isle of Man. And he, will, he wanted to have a place of rescue for sailors, and so he built and paid half the expense himself of the Tower of Refuge in 1832 on this island, and he kept it stocked with fresh water and bread and offered shelter from the weather and the sea. Now people make a trek to the Isle of the Tower of Refuge each year as part of a money raiser for charity. Well, in Paul's story, Refuge came in three phases, and I give tribute to Tommy L. Brooks Sr. for this insight. God is our refuge, and he's an anchor of God's presence. And that was shown in verse 23, where he said, I urge you to take heart, brothers. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God of whom I belong and whom I serve. Well, who doesn't want to have an angel speak directly to us? And how are we to dare even recognize an angel or a sign of God? Well, if we walk with God, we pray, if we read his word, we will hear from God. The next is the anchor of God's promises. In 24, he says, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. God has granted you all those who sail with you. Well, the prophecy says that all will be saved. No one could read into this at the time that he was talking to about being saved eternally. And if I were a shipmate, I suspect I would follow Paul on, once on shore when the prophecy that he gave was fulfilled. And there is the anchor of God's power. And in 44 it says, And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Well, this prophecy does come true. And God is obvious in the miraculous. An axe that flows, a donkey that talks, a sea that splits, or a resurrection of the dead. But it's in the non-miraculous that we should reinforce our faith when it's not obvious, not miraculous, when it's mundane. But unless our faith is grounded in the mundane, we'll miss the miraculous. We won't be part of the miraculous. So it's in the mundane that God works each day through the Holy Spirit to mold us. You now, what's not commonly known is that a way anchor, or anchors away, is an anchor that's hanging on the rope, not on the bottom. That's an anchor that's in readiness. It hasn't fulfilled its destiny, and only when it's used, that's embedded in movable rock, is an anchor fulfilling its purpose. Now, I know that some of you may be in a storm right now, and you've trimmed your sails, you've dumped the excess cargo, you've gone without, you've prayed, you've waited. Still, the storm rages. Why don't you hear from God's angels? Why don't you hear from God? How long will the storm last? Did you misunderstand God? Is God mad at at you? Are you mad at God? Well, clearly, I don't have all the answers, but I do have some advice. Set your anchor deep into something firm, something that does not move. And these are different kinds of anchors used for different purposes. But seek the anchor of God's presence, and that's in prayer. And seek the anchor of God's promises, and that's in scripture. Seek the anchor of God's power, and that's in companionship, and service, and relationship, and prophecy, foretelling prophecy. Now, it's normally at this point that I ask for comments, and to kick things off, I ask the men, are you mad at God? 
Have you been mad at God? And I got a lot of discussion, a lot of interesting insights, and I can't give them all here. There are too many. But some of them I'm going to summarize. That being angry is a human emotion. God can take it. Satan is the one that torments us, but God can test us. And when he does, he leaves a way out. And it's better to be angry with the situation than with God. And sometimes tribulations, like let's say your new car is being totaled, happens because a worse disaster was to be prevented, like the new airbags preventing death. There really are no simple answers in this. But I do recommend the anchor of God's presence and his prophecy and his power. We've been talking about the martyrs of the 20th century that are uh, shown in Westminster Abbey. Remember that church was built in about 906. Excuse me. Uh, it's, it represents here people in the 20th century who died for the name of Christ. And the ninth person is Lucian Tepidity. Uh, he was born around 1921 and educated in mission schools. And in 1941, he became a a uh, member of the staff at Sangara, and is a teacher and evangelist. This is uh, Lucien, and uh, he was present uh, around the 1942 at the Battle of Rabaul, where the Japanese invaded Papua and New Guinea. And he was down here in the tip of this island, Samurai, and the Japanese came into Rabaul and then moved on, and their goal was to get to Port Moresby, which was the uh, center of, of power for Papua. And uh, the people in the Samurai realized that they needed to leave this area. It was a commercial center, uh, but they were needed to move more towards Port Moresby for their safety. On the day after the evacuation, where they left and went from here to here, uh, the Right Reverend Strong broadcast a message to his staff and said, in essence, we must endeavor to carry out our work in all circumstances, no matter the cost. God expects this of us, and we shall not leave. We shall stay by our trusts. Let us trust and not be afraid. Well, members of a heathen tribe, to ingratiate themselves with the invaders, the Japanese, captured the missionaries as they were crossing a river, and they handed them over to the Japanese. Before they handed them over, the five missionaries, uh, Vivian Reddish, uh, Marguerite Benchley, Leela Lashmer, Henry Holland, and John Duffield, uh, their safety was um, important to Lucian as a native Papuan, and he pled with the captors to, uh, that these were good people who were trying to help the people of Papua and they were in the country um, for good purposes but his pleas were in vain and he was struck down by the heathen Papuans with an axe and he was killed. Later the missionaries were taken to the beach at Buna and uh, they were beheaded and their bodies were thrown into the sea. So this is the ninth person in the Hall of Martyrs, if you will, in the West Wing of Westminster Abbey. May God give you peace.